Hello and welcome again to this uh, lecture series on literary theory. As you know, we are in the middle of the section discussing feminism and its relation to literary studies. And in our previous lecture, we have tried to fix a tentative definition of the term feminism and we have then discussed the life and works of one of the major early modern feminists, Mary Wollstonecraft. In today's lecture, we will discuss two more important theorists of the feminist tradition, Virginia Woolf and Simone de Beauvoir and we will start with Virginia Woolf. Her dates are 1882 to 1941 and uh, Woolf was uh, born in London in a family which had a very strong literary and artistic connections. So, her father Leslie Stephen was a literary critic, a journalist and well known editor during his time and uh, Wolfe's mother's aunt Julia Margaret Cameron uh, was one of the greatest portrait photographers of the 19th century. Uh, Wolfe grew up uh, in a family which included a large number of siblings, not only the children of uh, her parents, but her half brothers and half sisters as well, who were children of Leslie Stephen and his wife from their early marriages. And um, it is now known that uh, unfortunately, as a child, Wolfe was sexually abused by some of her half brothers and a number of Wolfe's biographers have connected this sexual abuse in her early years with her later mental health issues. However, the dark shadow of sexual abuse aside, Wolfe's childhood was spent in an intellectually invigorating atmosphere. As a young woman, Wolf was an integral part of what is referred to as the Bloomsbury group or the Bloomsbury set, which was a circle of friends and uh, associates and included people like uh, the economist John Maynard Keynes, the literary critic Desmond McCarthy, the novelist E. M. Foster and the biographer Lytton Strachey. Wolf's future husband, the author and publisher Leonard Wolf, was also part of this bohemian circle. And uh, they together, uh, during the first half of the 20th century, represented the British intellectual avant-garde. Today, Wolf is uh, primarily remembered as a novelist whose works like Mrs. Dalloway or To the Lighthouse transformed the shape of modern British fiction. But apart from these novels, Wolf also wrote a number of very important non-fictions which are central to the feminist tradition of the 20th century. They are at the core of the feminist movement that defined the 20th century. In our lecture today, we are going to focus on one of these uh, non-fictions titled A Room of One's Own, which was initially delivered as uh, two separate lectures in the University of Cambridge and then were later woven together, expanded and published in the year 1929. But uh, before moving on to explore this particular work, I would like to briefly talk about Wolf's resistance to the term feminism. In her book length essay Three Guineas, which is also another very important non-fictional work that uh, Wolf wrote, she argues that feminism is a disparaging term that was forced upon individuals in the history who tried to speak on the behalf of women's rights. And also it is very interesting to note that in Three Guineas, Wolf 
considers feminism to be a dated term which needs to be quote unquote destroyed because as she explains it was quote a vicious and corrupt word that has done much harm in its day. In any case irrespective of Wolf's resentment towards the word feminism her works can be read and indeed has been read as amongst the most impassioned pleas for women's right which as per the definition that we are using our lectures makes her a feminist per excellence. So now let us come to the text a room of one's own. We had ended our previous lecture you remember on Mary Wollstonecraft by discussing how she envisaged the problems as well as the possibilities of women emerging on the socio-political stage as rational agents who were at par with men. In a Wolf's text, the focus is much narrower and it deals with the question, how can women write fiction? Yet this very specific uh, question leads Wolf to explore the norms and limitations of the patriarchal society at large, which gives her work a scope that is almost as broad as Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Women. Wolf's thesis is that, and I quote, a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. This statement, uh, which occurs at the very beginning of uh, Wolf's text, though simple in its phrasing, actually hides a rather revolutionary argument. In our discussion of uh, Wollstonecraft's life, we had seen how a very limited number of jobs were open to respectable women in the 18th century British society. And about a century and a half when Virginia Woolf was writing a room of one's own, not much had changed. Women could still not be gainfully employed which forced them forever to be at the mercy of men as far as financial sustenance was concerned. Wolf argues that having an income of 500 pounds a year would completely change this scenario for women. It would free them from the humiliation of having to do those inane jobs which allow them to earn but only a pittance and this will result in a sea change in the way women carry themselves within the society. So whereas now they have to work quote unquote they have to do things which one did not wish to do and to do it like a slave flattering and fawning with an access to 500 pounds a year, there will be a complete change in temper. Uh, to quote Wolf's own words, no force in the world can take from me my 500 pounds. Food, housing and clothing are mine forever. Therefore, not merely do effort and labor cease, but also hatred and bitterness. I need not hate any man. He cannot hurt me. I need not flatter any man. He has nothing to give me. So imperceptibly, I found myself adopting a new attitude towards the other half of the human race. Having a room of one's own, just like having money of her own, brings for uh, the woman a sense of freedom. This is because it helps her retire even if temporarily, from the routine of domestic chores. In other words, a room of one's own helps a woman to create a world of her own and to escape the role of being merely an angel of the house that is determined for her by the patriarchy.
So, uh, in this text, the question that Wolf takes up as to why there is so little great literature, quote unquote great literature, uh, written by women compared to that written by men is actually similar to the question of uh, why women are less rational than men that was taken up by Wollstonecraft. And like Wollstonecraft, Wolf too argues that though such differences might be true on the surface, they are caused not by any inherent shortcomings on the part of the women. Rather, they are the result of the lack of equal treatment and the lack of opportunity that a woman experiences within the patriarchal society. And to exemplify this point, Wolf presents a brilliant portrayal of a fictional character named Judith, who she imagines to be the sister of the most celebrated English author of all times, William Shakespeare. Now, uh, to make this imaginative portrayal of Judith effective, Wolf first presents a brief sketch of William Shakespeare's life. Wolf narrates how the famous playwright, being born as a male child in a well-to-do family, was given formal education which meant that he went to a school, he learnt Latin, he learnt um, classical literature, he also learnt elements of grammar and logic. And uh, clearly such a formal training contributed heavily towards his subsequent development as a playwright. As a young boy, William Shakespeare also had the necessary liberty to develop wild habits like poaching rabbits and shooting deer and uh, he also had the gumption to marry a girl of his own choice and marry at a time which suited him. Later when William Shakespeare ended up in London, he wanted to join the theatre and he was able to fulfil this wish by initially holding horses at the stage door and then getting admission inside the theatre where he got a job. And uh, since then there was no looking back for him. In Wolf's words, he became a successful actor and lived at the hub of the universe, meeting everybody, knowing everybody, practicing his art on the boards, exercising his wits in the streets and even getting access to the palace of the Queen. This life of the celebrated William Shakespeare is used by Wolfe to act as a foil to her depiction of the imaginary history of Judith. Judith is introduced as Shakespeare's quote-unquote wonderfully gifted sister and this phrase wonderfully gifted sister is important because the point that Wolf is trying to drive home here is that even if a woman is inherently as talented as man, within the patriarchal society she cannot be as successful as a man. Now uh, being a girl child, Judith would not have been sent to any school which meant that she would not have had any knowledge of um, grammar, let alone any exposure to classical literature. And even if uh, she was adventurous as her brother, she would have been asked to stay at home. And perchance, if out of curiosity, she would pick one of her brother's books and start reading it, um, Wolf says, and I quote, her parents would come in and tell her to mend the stocking or mind the stew and not moon about with books and papers. Now, though when compared to the upbringing of William Shakespeare, this might look like cruelty, Wolf is careful to point out that her parents would treat Judith like this, not because they felt any sense of hatred towards her. On the contrary, Wolf argues that they might even have been excessively concerned, excessively loving towards uh, their daughter. The treatment that uh, Judith receives as a child would rather be determined by the fact that she is a girl 
who is destined to be a woman and who like all respectable women of her time would be expected to perform domestic chores rather than concern herself with books and papers. So, uh, the way her parents would treat her was a reflection of the social norms rather than any personal hatred that they have towards their daughter. Now, Wolf says that eventually Judith's parents decide to get her married and when she protests, she says that she doesn't want to get married. Her father first beats her up and then begs her with tears that she should not hurt him, not shame him in this matter of her marriage. Here again note that uh, within the framework of patriarchal society, such an attitude towards Judith does not reflect hatred on the father's part, but rather love and excessive concern for the daughter's future. Judith, uh, who loves her father as much as he loves her, is therefore caught in a dilemma. Yet uh, she decides to allow her innate talent to flourish and rather than marry and settle down as a wife, she decides to run away to London. So in London, just like her brother, Judith also visits the theatre and she also asks for a job there. But being a woman, she is denied entry, she is denied a job. And uh, this is because we'll have to remember that in Shakespearean England, all actors, including those who played women's parts, were male. So Judith is laughed at and humiliated and not only does she uh, not get a job, uh, being a woman she is also unable to do simple things like for instance go to a tavern alone and ask for dinner or to roam around in the street in the middle of the night. Now in this state of destitution, homeless, without access to proper food, a theatre person takes pity on Judith, but he ends up sexually exploiting her and leaving her when she becomes pregnant. Wolf says that uh, this imaginary figure of Judith kills herself on a winter night and her body is now buried at a crossroad in London and buses now pass over it, uh, yet nobody knows about Judith, who was this wonderfully gifted sister of William Shakespeare. Now at one level this story is very disturbing because it is a tale of how a woman might literally be driven to kill herself by the expectations and parochialism of a patriarchal society. But at another level, this story sets the agenda for feminist literary theory because just like Wolf brings the focus on to the invisible Judith that nobody knows of, nobody has heard of. And a person who is as talented as her brother William Shakespeare. So the entire point of the story is not that Judith is a fictional character. The point of the story is even if Judith was real, we would most probably not have known her as a playwright. So what Wolf does is she brings the focus onto this invisible space of female writers and uh, a large part of feminist literary criticism would also concern itself with foregrounding the unknown half forgotten or marginalized women authors who uh, have not been able to make it to the great canons of literature simply because they are women. Uh, we will talk about this later in further details when we discuss gynocriticism in our next lecture. But today let us uh, move on to another major feminist theorist of the 20th century, Simone de Beauvoir. The Beauvoir's dates are 1908 to 1986 and uh, she is easily one of the most talented and multifaceted personalities of the 20th century Western intellectual history. She was a novelist, she was a philosopher, 
a political activist, a travel writer and of course the key figure who inaugurated what is known as the second wave of feminism. But for long she had been uh, known primarily as the partner, simply as a partner of the French intellectual Jean-Paul Sartre. This was of course partly due to the fact that Beauvoir was a woman and uh, as we have seen in the course of these lectures, women are usually placed second in importance uh, to men within patriarchal society. But uh, this reputation of being just a shadow of Sarge was also partly something of her own making because de Beauvoir uh, herself categorized her own works as little more than elaboration of Sartre's philosophy. However, later generation of feminists have tried to decouple uh, de Beauvoir as an intellectual from Sartre and they have to a large extent succeeded in establishing her reputation as a major intellectual figure of the 20th century by her own right. Now, uh, de Beauvoir, unlike uh, Wolf, did receive a formal education and uh, was in fact the ninth woman to receive a degree from Sorbonne and uh, the first woman to qualify the prestigious competitive examination of aggregatio in philosophy. Uh, and Sartre incidentally stood first in that examination and Simone de Beauvoir stood second. And this uh, being second, the notion of standing second to a man would play a major role in uh, how uh, Beauvoir would theorize uh, about the condition of women. We will see that. Between 1929 and uh, 1943, de Beauvoir worked as a school teacher, after which she economically sustained herself through her writings. Uh, though uh, de Beauvoir is primarily known outside uh, France today as a philosopher, her first major publication was a novel titled She Came to Stay, uh, which was published in 1943. And in fact, it was as a novelist uh, that uh, she would receive uh, one of the major awards of France, uh, the literary prize Prix Goncourt, uh, which was given for her 1954 fiction, The Mandarins. But um, undoubtedly, de Beauvoir's uh, most influential work was uh, Le Deuxième Sex uh, or The Second Sex, which was published in 1949 and which acted as a trigger that unleashed the second wave of feminist movement. In the remaining time today, our focus would therefore be on this work and we will try and understand some of the arguments that de Beauvoir makes in uh, The Second Sex. Now, uh, this book, The Second Sex, is um, a text which has multiple layers and uh, therefore it is difficult to summarize or paraphrase it. But uh, the main argument in that book is that women within the patriarchal society is looked upon as an other of the man. Uh, that is to say, whereas men are regarded as a norm, women are regarded as some sort of a corrupt deviation from that norm, making them, as the title claims, the second sex. Now, this argument in itself is nothing new. We have, in fact, already encountered this argument as far back as the late 18th century in the writings of um, Mary Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Women. What is unique, however, is the comprehensive way in which uh, de Beauvoir elaborates this central feminist argument which references philosophy, references history, science, literature as well as the concrete day-to-day -day lived experiences of women. De Beauvoir uh, starts her thesis by looking at the various explanations uh, which are usually provided to justify women's position as um, the deviant other to the normal men. And she first attacks the claim that women are quote-unquote naturally 
different from men. Thus, as we know, it is often argued that nature made man and woman as distinct and separate entities and this is, uh, this argument is often used to justify their sexual as well as their gender which are supposedly inferior to that of men. Now, de Beauvoir argues that there is nothing inherently natural in the sexual and gender distinction because uh, she says that there are one-celled organisms in nature, there are hermaphrodite species which uh, procreate uh, without any need for this uh, sexual distinction. So, to label the othering of women as natural and as based on their sexual distinction is unsuitable, is, is unsustainable rather because if it was natural then it would be a universally occurring phenomenon. She then goes on to attack the discourse of Freudian psychoanalysis which too provides an apparently natural reason for women's inferiority. Uh, so, as we know from our earlier discussion, for Freud, the male child was taken as the norm and uh, Freud's theory of the normal psychosexual uh, development of the human being as articulated through the idea of the Oedipal complex uh, was predicated on the presence of the male penis. And since a girl child does not have a penis, Freud regarded the woman's body as a site of lack and he argued that uh, their psychosexual development proceeded via a much more convoluted and therefore quote unquote unnatural route. De Beauvoir challenged uh, this Freudian lens of looking at women as simply damaged men and questioned the psychoanalytic theory which defines identity almost entirely in terms of unconscious drives and impulses and largely neglects the role of individual choice for instance and even more importantly the role of social values and norms in shaping one's gender identity and this is something that de Beauvoir is going to focus on. Now, de Beauvoir also attacks the Marxist or rather more specifically the theory proposed by Engels that uh, women are treated as inferior because uh, of the division of labor which identifies men as breadwinners. Now, uh, de Beauvoir would uh, be affiliated to the Marxist philosophy in general, but here she um, uh, picks up a difference with Engels and she argues that this theory does not explain how such a division of labor um, at all came into place and it is this that she then sets, on, uh, sets out to explain in her text. So, de Beauvoir argues that women's othering happened in the primitive human society because she was identified with the process of reproduction and procreation. Now, since this is at the core um, of uh, de Beauvoir's argument, we will go over it slowly. According to de Beauvoir, sexual reproduction, though important, is uh, looked upon as a repetition of the same, which is ubiquitous in the whole of the animal world. Uh, all animals procreate and they repeat their sameness through that procreation. For uh, de Beauvoir, human being as a race from the very beginning valued progress over repetition. So, in other words, humans valued productive action which would help them surpass their own conditions of existence over reproduction which would merely help them sustain as a race through the repetition of the same. This resulted in the original devaluation of women within the society because women were caught up in the cycles of reproduction and childbearing and in contrast men 
could afford to be more adventurous, more outgoing, and they became inventors who, in order to increase their tribe's resources to sustain life, produced various things. So, in de Beauvoir's uh, own words, because housework alone is compatible with the duties of motherhood, the woman is condemned to domestic labor, which locks her into repetition and immanence. Day after day, it repeats itself in identical form from century to century. It produces nothing new. Man's case is radically different. To appropriate the world's treasures, he annexes the world itself. Though such action, through such actions, he tests his own power, he posits ends and projects paths to them. He realizes himself as existent. To maintain himself, he creates, he spills over the present and opens up the future. De Beauvoir argues that it is because man is able to open up the future through his inventions, through his productive activities, that he establishes himself as the normative human being. The woman, on the other hand, had to keep away from this adventurous life but by what de Beauvoir calls, quote-unquote, the absurd fertility and therefore she becomes the second sex. And uh, this subservient status which is established in the primitive human tribe is then further continued and even confirmed as the human society moved towards the concept of private property and uh, in that scenario women are reduced to the status of being property owned by one man or the other. De Beauvoir points out that the status of women as the other is constantly uh, and consistently maintained within the society through constant mythologizing. Now, this means that either in the form of religious discourse or in the form of uh, literature, we are constantly fed with images of women either as goddesses or as dangerous sexual temptresses. And in both uh, the cases, the images of women are uh, constructed as being images that are beyond the normal human being. And in both the cases, the images are actually projections of men's own fears and desires and wishes. Which means that even when uh, she is being hailed as a goddess, a woman is uh, being defined by men by their wishes, their desires, their fears. And uh, if you want to understand how frustrating this situation can be for a woman, I would uh, suggest you watch Shotujitra's 1960 film Debi, literally the goddess, which depicts the horrific process of deification of a woman by a patriarch. Anyway, coming back uh, to um, De Beauvoir, in the second sex, she supplements these abstract theoretical arguments about the status of uh, the woman as the other by providing a narration about the concrete life experiences of women within the patriarchal society and uh, by showing how these life experiences are affected by the consistent process of devaluation of women within the society. And uh, de Beauvoir argues that this process actually starts from the very childhood when uh, the members of the family in particular and the society in general, uh, they try to groom uh, the girl child as a woman and uh, teach her to be quote unquote feminine. This uh, process of becoming feminine uh, involves training the girl in domestic chores which fixes for her a particular kind of role within the society. It also uh, involves alienating the girls from their own growing bodies 
by associating the notion of shame with female sexual desire and with puberty. A dosage of literature like Cinderella or The Sleeping Beauty teaches the girl to be submissive in love and to believe that their redemption lies in the arrival of some prince charming. And when the promised man arrives to quote unquote redeem the woman through marriage, it proves to be an ambiguous affair for her because at one level it does give the woman financial stability, but at another level it also traps her in an unequal relation where she is expected to um, be guided by her husband, to serve her husband and to connect with the wider world through him. De Beauvoir points out that this lack of personal freedom within marriage has in turn dangerous consequences for the woman's identity as a mother because she then projects her marital frustrations onto her relations with her own children. And also uh, de Beauvoir points out that a woman's desire to gain agency which is usually frustrated within uh, the marital relationship, within uh, the relationship that she has with her husband manifests itself through an excessive attempt to control her children which again in itself is rather unhealthy. But then what does de Beauvoir suggest? How should a woman escape this trap of inferiority, this trap of being relegated to the second sex? De Beauvoir points out that uh, women during her time has definitely far more rights and privileges than what they had earlier. But she also argues that even if one takes all of these rights together, they cannot really emancipate a woman until and unless she also has economic autonomy. So in other words, though we uh, see women gaining a lot of uh, civic liberties in today's world, the key factor to watch out for according to de Beauvoir is women's participation in the productive workforce as fully paid workers. And uh, here we see that in most countries the ratio of working men to working women is abysmally low and even when we see women being uh, incorporated within the workforce, we know that their status as second sex is still maintained there. They are uh, for instance, paid less often, they are paid less uh, to perform the same work uh, as their male colleagues. De Beauvoir's solution therefore is that uh, women should escape from the trap of their quote unquote absurd fertility and move from merely performing reproductive uh, functions within the society to performing more and more productive roles. Yet uh, de Beauvoir also acknowledges that this is a difficult move because it is regarded in the patriarchal society as undermining a woman's femininity which usually defines her within the society. However, de Beauvoir stresses that this is a move that is important and that must be accomplished in order for the men and the woman to meet as equals for the reign of freedom to triumph in society. These are her words and um, for the two sexes to meet not as battling counterparts but rather as peers who come together to quote unquote unequivocally affirm their brotherhood. So with this we end our lecture today. We will carry forward our discussion on feminism and literary studies in the next lecture. Thank you.